Mix with your ears, not your eyes. We've all heard it a thousand times and it's wrong. So keep watching to find out why. Hey guys, Dilby here. Welcome back to the channel. What we're going to talk about today is using visual aids in the production process, mixing, writing, whatever. If you've been on the internet in any way, shape or form searching for production advice, then you've probably encountered use your ears, not your eyes. And this is good advice. But the thing is, for that advice to hold true, it means that your ears have to be telling you the whole story. And that may not be the case. It takes a long time to be able to hone your ears and hear specific things and details within a mix. It's taken me years and I still feel like I'm getting better at this all the time. The other thing that this doesn't address is the environment in which you're listening. Most people don't have the luxury of an acoustically perfect studio. I've got a lot of acoustic treatment in here, but it's still definitely not perfect. I'll link a video up here where I show you how I made the acoustic panels in my studio. They're pretty cost effective and even a DIY novice like myself can make them so you can probably do it 10 times better. Like I said, it does take a long time to hone your skills and if you're not using all of the tools available, then you are missing out. That's why I felt it was important to make this video to demonstrate some of the visual referencing techniques that I use. To help out some of the viewers with mixing, from now until the end of July, I'm going to offer a free feedback session for anyone that books in and mix down with me. This is something I normally charge for, but I know it's hugely beneficial, so I just want to offer it out there and see how it goes. I do have limited capacity, so if you are interested in my mix down services, the email address is in the description of the video. I recommend getting in touch as soon as possible to ensure that we can get it done. Also in the description, you're going to find a link to my Patreon, which is one of the best ways that you can help to support the channel. So jump over there, have a look. But for now, let's jump into Ableton and have a look at these techniques, eh? So here we are inside Ableton, and the first thing I want to show you is using a reference track to gauge relative volumes for the elements in your mix. Now we can't do this for everything, but we can do it for some of the foundational elements of the track. This is going to give us a really solid starting point for our mix. So I've got this reference track here from Oliver Shorey, it's called Lim, really great track. Go download it from Beatport or stream it on Spotify. And what I've done is just chopped out a few little bits that we can use to reference the relative volume. This track's already mastered, which means it's already got limiting, compression, etc. already applied. So we can't gauge an exact volume for our elements, but we can gauge a relative volume, which means the volume of one element compared to the volume of the other element. The difference in volume, if you like. So one of the easiest things that we can do is do this with the kick. So let's listen to the kick. So we've got this one with a snare on it. We're not really interested in that. We're just interested in the kick. And what we're using to measure this volume is the dynamic range on the spectrum device. We've got this set to auto here. So this is going to automatically register the dynamic range in whatever it's referencing. In this case, the Oliver Shorey's track. So this is the loudest point and this is the quietest point. We know that the kick is going to be louder than this hi-hat. Let's just check that. So minus 35. So with the kick, it's minus 10. So the kick is generally going to be the loudest or one of the loudest elements in the track. So now we've got our starting point. And what we're going to try and do here is establish the volume relationship between kick and bass in the track. It's important to choose the right reference track, something that you think sounds balanced, that's in a similar style to what you're going for. So you have to try and be a bit clever here and find places in the track where you can kind of isolate elements that you want to hear. I found this little mini break where the kick is taken out, but the bass line plays. So let's just take a listen to that. Right, so we've got a bass, 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 bass. So let's just take out this one. Doesn't really matter too much. As I showed you before with the kick, the hi-hat's not going to add to the overall volume, we're just going to go for it with the bass. Even though there's hi-hats playing on top of a couple of the bass notes. If we listen to the whole thing, so there we can see that the maximum volume is minus 14, which tells us that the maximum volume of the bass is 4 dB lower than the maximum volume of the kick. So that gives you a reference point to set your kick and bass. If you, it's relatively arbitrary, but if you set your kick to, let's say, minus 5, then you would set your base so it peaks at minus nine. That way we're creating a relative difference in those elements that's equal to the relative difference in the reference track. One more step we can take is to just separate these base elements a little bit. Now I can see if there's differences in volume between the notes of the base. 14. 14, 18, 
So we can see that there's some difference in volume in the baseline, but it's got a pretty small dynamic range with a difference of up to 4 dB in the volume from each bass note. This is helpful for us to gauge how much compression we need to apply to the bass so that it's similarly balanced. So setting that kick and bass volume together using a reference track that you really like is going to set you in a great stead for getting that right. It doesn't have to be exact, but it gives you a really good solid starting point where you probably only have to adjust the volume balance like one or two dB to get it into the sweet spot for your track. In this example, what we're going to look at is reading waveforms and how you can use that to identify maybe potential issues in your track. So reading waveforms can be so helpful. It can tell you so much about the track, about the mix, about the balance of the elements. The example I've got here is a recent mastering job that I had come through, and we're looking at the pre-master wave file. I identified straight away that there was a problem with the mix and was able to tell the client very, very quickly and easily that there were some key issues in the balance of his mix. So the problem I identified was that the kick was too quiet and the bass line was much too loud. I quickly sent him an email asking him to increase the kick by 3 to 5 dB, I think, and decrease the bass line by, I think, something like 5 or 6 dB. He was able to go away and work on that with those guidelines and obviously finesse it a little bit for himself as to what worked for his taste and for the track. But we're going to have a quick listen and I'm going to show you how this ended up impacting the end result. So this is the first mix that he sent me. And here where the bass comes in. So that bass is really loud and proud there. And let's just zoom into the waveform here. So we can see that this is the kick and this is the bass. The bass is quite a lot louder than the kick, especially say here. And the thing with the pre-master is that everything is going to be amplified in the mastering process. So any issues are going to become much bigger and impact the end result much more. I'm going to demonstrate this too, but first let's just have a look at the file that he sent through with some changes. And let's listen again to the original. I can see how someone might actually go for the first version. It does sound a lot more impactful, and the second version sounds a bit dull, to be honest. A bit flat. I've tried to get these to like relatively similar volumes, so all of the other elements, other than the kick and bass, are at a pretty similar volume. Now let's add some limiting. This is obviously not a full master, but it's, we're getting it to a relative loudness. So we've added a limiter and we're getting it to somewhere around minus 8.5 LUFS, right? Now let's do it with the new pre-master. Pretty big difference, right? Listen to how muddy the first one is. Doesn't the mix sound so much more spacious and punchy? And that's only to do with the relative volumes between the kick and the bass. Here's a look at the waveform. If we zoom in, so you can see the kick is there really loud and proud, and the bass is sitting a bit lower. And that's going to really help push the groove of the track, as the bass is going to be grooving against the kick rather than kind of overpowering everything in the mix. So by using the waveform as a visual aid, you can get a lot of information when comparing your track to a reference track. So how you can do that is export your mix, bring it in, and compare the waveform of your track with a reference track. But, and this is very important, in order to do that properly, you will need to add limiting to get it to a relative loudness. Otherwise, the waveforms are going to look totally different, and the dynamic range is going to be totally different. So I suggest using a loudness meter, gauging the loudness on your reference track, and then adding a limiter to your track to get it to a relative loudness. Another thing you can do is use a plugin like Oscillos Megascope, which gives you a readout of the waveform. And what's extra special about this one is we can duplicate it onto another channel. And now it's going to show us those waveforms side by side. So you can get a really quick comparison. The downside of that is that the visual aid is dynamic. So the output is continually changing based on whatever is happening in your track. 
exporting your mix and dragging it in means that you can go through and analyze it in a little bit more detail. But I do really value the Oscillus Megascope. It's super handy just to get a quick reference, quick glance. Now we're going to look at using Voxengo Span, which is a free spectrum analyzer. And I'm going to show you how to use the frequency spectrum of a reference track to identify where areas in your mix may be lacking. So the reference track that I've got in here is my track Maruba. As I feel like it's kind of in a similar vibe to the one I'm working on. So what I'm going to do is find a place in Maruba that's got a piano, because I think there is one. So we're going to use that part there. I'm going to just select it like that. Now I'm going to loop it because we want it to be the same all the way along. Step one is to match the loudness. I'm just going to play my new track because I don't want to get my video copyright claimed. Let's check this out. Okay, so somewhere between minus 7.5, minus 8. What I'll do is add some limiting until we get to a similar loudness. So that's close enough. Now it's worth mentioning I do have a full video on Span. I'm not going to go into how to set everything up in loads of detail. I'll link that up here so you can check it out and follow along with exactly how to set this up. Basically what we're going to do is add a sidechain input from our reference track. Now this sidechain input only became available at some later update in Live 10. So if you don't have it available, then you'll need to upgrade to a version that does have it available, either a later version of Live 10 or any version of Live 11. So this is what Span looks like. See here I've got blue and red. Blue is going to be the frequency spectrum of the track that I'm working on, and red is going to be the frequency spectrum of the reference track that's being fed in in the sidechain here. So let's just take a listen and we can see what's going on. So not too dissimilar actually, I guess some kind of in a relatively okay ballpark for my mix as I'm going along. But you can see that it's a little bit duller in the highs and the kick's a little bit lower, the bass is maybe a little bit too high. So these little fine adjustments. But let's just say I take this hat group and pull it all down by 4 dB. I'll click here to reset it. Now let's have a listen. So we can see there that there's quite a bit of energy missing in the high end. Similarly, if I was to pull my bass down by 5 dB, we can see that there's some energy missing here. And just for a final demonstration, let's do it also with the kick group. So what that's showing me is that the kick is quite a bit lower and the, the relative volume to the bass is quite different. See here, the relative volume is like this. One more thing I can see is that frequency wise, the kick and the bass are more separated in the reference track. That isn't necessarily a bad thing, that's just to do with the key, relative key that we're playing in. But what it does signal to me is that there could be some kind of masking issues between the kick and bass. So maybe I need to apply a stronger side chain than I normally would. Maybe I need to do some kind of match EQing to bring out frequencies in the kick and take them away in the bass or vice versa. But it's just a really great visual reference that tells me a bunch of information about my track that I may not have heard with my ears. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Hopefully you found that useful and hopefully it can help you to advance your production techniques. If you're looking for more videos on mixing, referencing, that type of thing, then check out this playlist I've put together. Well, that's it from me today. We'll catch you next time. Peace.